Professor Jansen is currently president of the South African Institute of Race Relations and president of the South African Academy of Science. He started his career as a biology teacher in the Cape after receiving his science degree from the University of the Western Cape. He obtained MSc, an MSc degree from Cornell University and a PhD from Stanford. He holds honorary degrees from the University of Edinburgh, University of Vermont, and Cleveland State University. He was in, in 2013, he was awarded the Education Li Africa Lifetime Achiever Award in New York, the Spend Love Award from the University of California for his contributions to tolerance, democracy, and human rights. He has also won the largest book award from the British Academy for Social Sciences and Humanities. He's published many books. I'm not going to tell you about them, because, but you're going to buy them. Uh, I introduce Prof. Jansen to you, who's been here before, and he's going to share his wisdom with us tonight. Well, good evening, everyone. I've got some good news. I am the proud grandfather of a little girl who today is seven months old. Her name is Zara. And I wanted to show you the picture of me reading to uh, 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 my granddaughter. Uh, they live in Pretoria. Uh, my son uh, married a Pretoria girl. And, uh, uh, and that was a problem, but I'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> and, uh, and so they uh, came from the truth. They're both teachers. He's a psychologist in a school, and she teaches pre uh, early childhood, whatever they call it. And so they came for the June holidays. And of course, you know, uh, 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 they would uh, um, have their own philosophy of child uh, rearing. <laughs> like, I believe if a kid sh cries, you, l you just make sure they're fed and clean, and then let them cry, <laughs> and they'll fall asleep. They don't believe that. They feed on demand. They're up all night. They're tired. So they come into my bedroom at five in the morning and they give Zara to me <laughs> so that they can sleep. And so I took her downstairs one morning and I got this beautiful picture. And I'm reading to her uh, from a series of books I bought her before she was even born, which is Dr. Seuss's series, The Cat! <laughs> in that. In the hat, my brother. Are you with it, man? <laughs> the cat in the hat, and then she got bored, and so I took out uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace, <laughs> and she settled down, she settled down, she settled down, she's a Jansen, she settled down, and, uh, and so on, but it's, what, what, it's such a great joy, you know, uh, uh, first grandchild, you know, and of course, um, uh, my son's problem uh, was that he married a white kid, and this is a huge problem for me, so when he came home, um, with this uh, girl. We were still living in Bloemfontein. And he said, uh, I, I said to Mikhail, of all the beautiful black women in this country, <laughs> you come home with a white kid. So he says to me, Dad, get over it. You cannot meet Catherine's parents at the wedding. It was two weeks from the wedding. <laughs> um, so my wife and I jumped in the car in Bloemfontein and drove to Linwood, Pretoria to meet the enemy. And when we got there, when we got there, when we got there, Things were tense. And my son came tiptoeing over to me. He says, Dad, whatever you do, do not embarrass me. I said, son, have I ever embarrassed you? And of course, he just rolled his eyes like you kids do, the kids do, you know. And, uh, but it was tense. On the one side sat the, the white Bartlett's, and on the other side, the black Jansons. You, you know, and uh, um, I thought I'd let the green stuff come by first, the salads, so when the salads come by, <laughs> said nothing. And then when the red meat came, I decided to speak to these white people as if they were deaf. <laughs> so I said, sir! <laughs> See, I'm a wordsmith. Every word is uh, uh, thought about in advance, sir. So I said, sir! What first crossed your minds when my son decided to darken your doorstep? <laughs> Woo! 
my poor kid went sliding under the table. <laughs> but you know, his future mother-in-law, immediately, her name is Brenda, immediately she, st uh, she, she, she spoke back. And you know what endeared me to Brenda? Is she did I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I grew up here in the retreat in Steenberg, like the sister over there, you know. So, so uh, you know, uh, uh, I developed an attitude towards white people who speak English as if they're still in Nottingham. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I'm putting myself on the line tonight. Don't judge me. I'm here in all my brokenness. So she didn't speak like these people in, uh, uh, did you know there's a place called Weinberg proper? Like there's Weinberg? <laughs> where all the shitty people live and Weinberg proper. <laughs> did you know there's Kenilworth and Upper Kenilworth? And God help you if you're on the wrong side of Kenilworth, you know? <laughs> so she didn't speak like those aunties in Kirsten Bosch and, and, and so on. She spoke in working class English. And this is what she said. So when I asked her, you know, what she thought when my kid showed up at the door, this is what she said. She spoke in this working class. Yeah, and she said, well, I said to myself, Brenda, Brenda, I said, are you truly a non-racist? How many white people do you know that when they're faced with a situation involving race, they don't judge that person, they question themselves? I don't meet many people like Certainly not in Stellenbosch. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that place is really isolated. <laughs> Did you know there's a big difference between the culture here and, in, and that side of the N2? There's a lot of aunties there that don't know there's a new government. I'm telling you, it's... A, it's <laughs> you talk about the Herschel bubble. You haven't seen bubbles, you know? <laughs> till you get to Stellenbosch. And you know when she said that, when she said, I questioned myself. I ran towards her, gave her a big hug, because she's big, and I said, welcome <laughs> to our family. And we've become best friends ever since. But I struggled, I'm being honest with you. He came home with this white kid. And now, of course, the baby, unfortunately, looks white. <laughs> And so, of course, uh, when the baby was born, my wife and I jumped in the car, went off to, uh, flew off the early that morning to Pretoria Academic Hospital to be with our grandchild. And then my wife's family, they're from Parkwood Estate North, <laughs> also known as Fairways. But <laughs> So they start to call. Now they know they must not come to me with any racist <laughs> but, um, but the emotions of the moment, you know, overwhelms them. There's a baby born and so on. So, of course, they're calling from uh, 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 Fairway of uh, wherever. And, and, and I pick up my cell phone at 6 a.m. in Pretoria, and they say, Jonathan, we're so happy about the baby. Now, between you and me, sir, when a baby is born, what are the typical questions a normal person asks if you're away from the scene? Is the baby healthy? <laughs> and in this metrosexual age, you also ask, is the father okay? Oh, yes. <laughs> that had nothing to do with it, but is the father okay? What is another question, ma'am? Boy or girl? Is it a boy? Or a girl. Or a girl. <laughs> but according to UCT's new policy, it can be something else as well, you know? Not <laughs> just a boy or a girl. Those are the typical questions normal people ask, except my racist in-laws. <laughs> Jonathan, what is she? Oh, you know, my doctor is here tonight. He'll tell you my blood pressure is normally quite normal. <laughs> but my blood pressure goes up when you ask me such rubbish. <laughs> what is she? So, of course, I told her. I said I think she might be gay. No, man, don't be political. <laughs> what is she? I'm being political. And I'm so sorry to tell the white people here. I love you, my brothers and sisters. I really do. But there's a good chance you're not white. <laughs> I 
I don't know how South Africans got to come to think of themselves as four races. What the rubbish is that? Have you ever read a book called How the Irish Became White? That will scare the hell out of you. White is not a color. And there are some white people here, be honest with me. All of you have an Uncle Gert. <laughs> Nobody talks about Uncle Gert. His hair doesn't quite go the same way as everybody else's hair. And it makes sense. Do you think you can live together for 350 years and not screw each other? You think it's only the Catholics? We actually all colored by the old definition. Oh, I love the movie Krotoa. You know why? It's a horrible movie except for the last two minutes where they show the credits and they show all the white people related to Krotoa. I love it. <laughs> F.W. de Klerk, everybody. <laughs> We're human. And we've gotten to this ridiculous position of thinking of ourselves as a race. And I want to raise Zara as a grandfather, the way I raised my two children, Mikhail and Sarah, so that they truly are, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, never to be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I love the Afrikaans word, character. And yet, all of you, all of us, we raise our children, sometimes unknowingly, with a sense of being a race. I can almost hear white parents when they talk to me. I do a lot of workshops with white parents, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on in this horrible country. And they say to me, but Professor, you know, our children, they get along very well at school. And by the way, that's true. Before puberty. Before puberty, you're quite happy for your kid to play with black kids. <laughs> but the moment they hit puberty, you start to become before you worry. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> Like my relatives in Parkwood Estate North, what will the kids look like? <laughs> so all of you look normal until we meet you. And please don't tell me it's not true. It is. And I was worried. I said, Mikhail, why Catherine? Turns out she's the most gorgeous, wonderful uh, daughter in law. <laughs> that I could ever get. And the reason my son made that choice is because since the day he was born, they were both born outside of this country, but since the day he was born in New York, his sister in California, when they woke up, they saw in our home Muslims, Christians, Jews, they saw every part to this day. When they woke up, they saw straight people in our home and gay people. When they woke up, they saw people from Tanzania and people from Zambia. They saw that our friends were Latin American and they saw that our friends were from here. In other words, they grew up in a home where you couldn't predict on a Friday night who comes over for the bride. That's not true for most of you. You just go to Cavendish Square right now and just go look at any restaurant. It's occasionally the case that you see black and white at the same table. We tribal. And this was difficult for me, I'll be honest with you. Because I grew up in a home in Stienberg and the retreat later on when my parents were evangelical Christians. Oh my God. Do you know how tough that is? When your mother who was Dutch reformed <coughs> becomes born again? And her name is Sarah. I make, I'm not making this up. And your father, who was Anglican, also thought the Anglicans were going to hell because they could dance and drink and do all sorts of nonsense and still, you know, have kids. So he also became born again. And his name was Abraham. <laughs> Imagine being the son of Sarah and Abraham. How God put them together is a mystery because Sarah was from Montague. Abraham was from Lansdowne. The one spoke English. My father, my mother spoke Afrikaans. 
It was horrible. And so now they're born again, and I'm the firstborn. <laughs> and I had to take the first clap because my names are Jonathan David. <laughs> and what they didn't tell me, that that's the first gay couple in the Bible. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's news to you, I suppose. No, it says so very clearly in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 9, that the love of Jonathan for David was greater than the love of a man for a woman. Hello? <laughs> this was rough. My brother after me is Peter, the rock upon which Christ built the church. My sister in the middle is Naomi. You know Naomi and Ruth. And my youngest surviving brother is Abraham, Sarah. And he's the really naughty one. I would often beseech my parents to offer him up as a burnt sacrifice <laughs> to the Lord. <laughs> but they wouldn't do that. And the good thing about growing up in the brethren, about growing up in the super holy, moralistic Christian environment, the good thing is I never smoked, I never drank, I never got into trouble, I was never in prison. You know, I never saw my parents fight with each other. I can honestly tell you this. I never once in 50 years had my father raise his voice with my mother. Not once. So around me, the kids were going in and out of Palsmo prison. Around me, the dead ones were going to Clip Cemetery. Around me, there was chaos. But I never saw that. That was the good side. You know what the bad side was? Everybody else was wrong. The Muslims were wrong. The Jews were wrong. The Catholics were wrong. Everybody was going to hell except the brethren. I remember coming home with my first girlfriend. Her name was Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> and I held her hand and stood in front of my mother. And I said, Mom, I would like you to meet my girlfriend, Fatima. Oh, my mother. <laughs> Woo! You are not coming home with a Fatima! <laughs> you know how Kay Platt's mother's talk? A Fatima! And the tears rolled down my face. I said, oh, why can't I go out with Fatima? Because you're only five years old. No, I'm, no, I'm just saying no, you know, I'm just, I'm just, no, that is wrong, you know. <laughs> and then one day I decided, when a guy talked crap from the platform at the retreat gospel hall, and he compared, and I was still like these young people over here, you know, seriously activists as a university student, and he says that Barabbas reminded him of an ANC terrorist. And I got up and raised my hands, which you never do in the evangelical church. And I just felt myself going up and I thought, it's the rapture. <laughs> Except there was two elders throwing me out of the church. <laughs> and since that day, I decided not to go to church. And I've never been back because I said to myself, as I will tell you here today, it doesn't matter how often you go to church if your life does not reflect church. So why do you need to transform your school? I don't want to be tactical with you. I want to cut to the chase. The reason your school has to be transformed, as you heard from these wonderful young men, is because it's the right thing to do. Yes, there are benefits, educational, social, political. But the real reason you should do it as an Anglican school is because it's the right thing to do. I could never understand as a young person how there could be white churches in the Brethren and colored churches and African churches. I just couldn't get my head around John 14. Many mansions cannot mean <laughs> four races. And I believe that when Christ died on the cross, he actually died to bring us together. So why the hell are we living hypocrites? So don't ask me questions like, oh, you know, is the quota system right or wrong? Please, that's boring. Ask yourself as a Christian, is this the right thing to do? We can solve this country's educational problems overnight. If you just understood what you read. So my mother taught me this story. It's a really interesting story. Now that I revisit it as an older person. And it's a story that appears in both Matthew and in Luke's Gospels. About a guy who was a real idiot. You know what he did? 
He had 99 sheep. You know that story, sir? Yeah, you look Jewish, so you probably don't know this one. <laughs> but, uh, and he's got 99 sheep. And one of them decides to go a wall. So what does a good actuary do under those circumstances? <laughs> uh, look for the sheep. Oh my God, you don't know actuaries. What does a good actuary do, ma'am? And uh, you've got 99 sheep safe. One of them decided to go for a walk. What do you do as an accountant? You count them. You count them. Yo, oh, these UCT graduates. What do you do, sir? Cut your losses. You cut your losses. You say goodbye, one sheep. You say bad debt, write it off. I've got 99. That are safe. I'm not going to risk them to the elements. I'm not going to risk them to the wolves. I've got 99. This is how you think if you're wealthy. I've got 99. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Except the good shepherd does the opposite. He leaves the 99. Hear me now. He goes to look for the one. He finds the one. And what does he do? What does a Cape Flats mother do? When you find your child who got lost in the mall. <laughs> you smack the kid. <laughs> you ain't old slut worry. <laughs> that not good for you a lesbian. You, you beat up the kid. What does the good shepherd do? He takes the sheep. Puts it on his shoulders, and where does he go? Goes back to 99 sheep. He goes what? Goes back to 99 sheep. You are Jewish. No! <laughs> <laughs> he takes the sheep home, not to the field. And he calls his buddies, and they throw a jaw. Why? Because he found the sheep. That was lost. That was lost. Amen. If, why are the black people giving all the right answers and the rest of you <laughs> don't read your Bibles? <laughs> he found the sheep that was lost. Imagine every member of the cabinet. Imagine the Minister of Education said, I'm, stop, I'm not going to brag about the kids who made it with fake results like mathematical literacy and life orientation and all that crap. <laughs> if your kid is doing math lit, take them out of the school. They're not being taught well. Nothing wrong. Woo, I went to a school the other day. Ooh, this is horrible. I'm not going to mention the school because it's very close. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it's a boys' school. <laughs> Private boys' school. <laughs> I'm not mentioning names. And the principal says to me, you know, you know, I, I love the way the English speak in South Africa, you know. Uh, you know, if an Afrikaans guy talks to you, you know, he says, I can only f and you know exactly where you stand. <laughs> the English guy would tell you the same thing, but it's only when you get home and you shower at night that you realize you've been insulted. <laughs> but <laughs> so as we walk in to address the parents on the night like this, he says to me, Professor Johnson, I do not mean in the slightest to even begin to suggest, I think, get to the <laughs> point, you know, <laughs> I do not mean to even begin to suggest that to, to suggest what you should talk about, but I know your views on mathematical literacy. Can you please not say in, I'm not mentioning schools now, can you please not say anything about mathematical literacy? I said, sir, at your school you teach math, right? He said, yes, pretty sheepishly. I said, isn't the school, does the school that gave us Mark Shuttleworth? <laughs> oh, sorry, no, no names. <laughs> He said, that's true, but we also gave you Herschel Gibbs. I said, go right ahead, go right ahead, go, go right ahead, go right ahead, you know. Be inclusive, be inclusive. <laughs> Sense of belonging. <laughs> and so the reason we struggle, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the reason we struggle to transform our schools, I said to St. John's the other day, I'm happy to talk to you about transformation, but I know you don't want to transform. I said, I'll tell you why. First of all, there's white parents 
you are a hell of a scared of a lot of black kids in your school. Let's be honest. It's not you guys. I know that. <coughs> because we struggle with racism. And I appreciate the young lady saying we must talk about race. Not to beat people over the head, but to get beyond it. You don't get beyond it unless you go through it. That's why I admire Herschel's for opening up this conversation. When Logan called me, I said yes, partly because his mother-in-law is my friend, but otherwise, you know. <laughs> <coughs> you must talk about this stuff. Don't get uptight when people talk about the land question. The land you're living on right here was probably owned by Koi people and black people. I know. On both sides of my family was lost land in Montague and in Denver Road, Lansdown. I know how painful it is. Talk about it. Open it up. But most of all, because it's the right thing to do. <coughs> but schools struggle, partly because of racism, partly because of the fear of the unknown, and partly because you don't know how, which is why I came. And which is why you need to get my friends over here, Dylan Ray and Roy Hallands over here, to show you how to do that. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, I really do say this with all the love in my heart. The best way to do it is as a parent. A school can only do so much. My children were young when I took them to the homes of our best friends, Tahir and Zainab Saleh. They were in a mosque, in the Long Street Mosque. They'd been to every mosque. It didn't make them less of a Christian, it made them more of a human being. Do you know what this, the other day something happened that I, you know, I, I hadn't cried like that for a long time. A group of Muslim men came to see me at Stellenbosch, and as they left, this was at the height of Ramadan, as they left, they said to me, a professor, would you mind coming to break your f uh, break fast with us on Friday night? And I felt so honored. I said, yeah, that's what I do. That's, you know, I'll come. I said, gentlemen, where is this happening? I needed the address. Which mosque? Do you know what they said? the Weinberg Synagogue. I said, are you out of your... <laughs> Where? The brothers and sisters of the Weinberg Synagogue had invited the Muslim brothers to come on a Friday night in Ramadan to break fast. And after they broke fast, they went to the other side of the synagogue and they had Shabbat together. Just imagine that was normative. Just imagine that's just how we lived. Just imagine nobody would ask such a stupid question like who's from another religion in an Anglican school. Of course it's embarrassing if you're a kid. Just imagine you were really an Anglican school and you lived by those principles exemplified in the best known Anglican in our country, the arch. Don't talk to me about your Christianity unless I see it in the way you raise your children. So my daughter, of course, <coughs> was raised in the same way, except she has a different view of who's worth loving. So she comes, she gets a lot of hard, <laughs> hard time from her racist aunties here at the Cape. And she says to me, Dad, I'm in love. I said, Sarah, not again. <laughs> so this guy comes, ladies and gentlemen, from Durban on a bus to Bloemfontein, and it arrives at 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, I don't know about your culture, but in my culture, if a guy comes into my home to date my daughter at 3 a.m., I'm wide awake. So I was wide awake in the kitchen. <laughs> In he came. Now the purpose of a father is to make the life of a guy hell when it comes to date your daughter. So in he comes and he puts out his hand to greet me. Did I ask for his hand? 
No, so I left him hanging. <laughs> said, what's your name, young man? He says, Mpo. I said, ah, Mpo. All of my friends called him poor. Oh, woman, what have you not told my daughter? You know, I just needed clarity. <laughs> I said, where are you from? He said, Belito. I said, listen here, yeah, I've lived in this country all my life. There is no place in South Africa called Belito. There's, it's not even a Zulu name. <laughs> my daughter looked at me, she said, Dad, Google it. So I, Three in the morning. I opened my laptop, I Googled it. Did you know there's a place <laughs> north of Durban called Belito? I mean, how the hell must I know? <laughs> so I realize I'm getting nowhere with this kid. So 3 a.m., I went upstairs. You see, when my daughter was born in Menlo Park, California, and she was born by a cesarean section. And I was there as she was born. And I cried. And I wrote down, when the doctor saw blood, and, uh, you know, I saw the most beautiful girl in the whole wide world. And I wrote down 10 questions that any man who would date my daughter one day would have to successfully answer <laughs> every one of those questions. So I said, wait here. I went upstairs, opened the safe, took out the 10 questions, which was on paper that was yellowed with age, brought it down, and there sat this capsule next to my beautiful daughter. So I said, question number one, criminal record. He said, none. I said, bank account? He said, none. <laughs> I said, previous girlfriends? He said, none. And I realized this kid is pulling my chain, so I went straight to question seven because every boy has tripped up at question number seven. Because you see, as a Christian, I believe that the Bible is clear in Ezekiel chapter 7 and verse 19 that your daughter must not marry an uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> so I went straight to question seven. I looked him in the eye. I said, are you circumcised? And my daughter said, yes. <laughs> So you see, between these two children, I have kids who live the way their mother raised them. <laughs> who live in a way that doesn't regard race as an obstacle to communion. As children who don't <coughs> care, they, you know, they still struggle with race. They, they can't understand. I remember my son was at Pretoria Boys, and he came home one day in grade eight, and he said, Dad! And I said, oh, Lord, I just knew this is it. He said, they say I'm colored. I said, I need a name and I need kneecaps. Because <laughs> we didn't raise our kids to think of themselves by these ridiculous terms. We raised them to think of themselves as human. They've never filled out these stupid forms asking for your racial characterization. Because we taught them that your loyalties don't are not restricted to a border. You're not a South African, you're an internationalist. You care about people everywhere. They don't understand that. And so if you want to really, as one of the questions correctly posed, what do I do to raise my child in South Africa? The best thing you can do is to give them the experience in your home of what it means to be normal, because if the only black person they see is the domestic, they're screwed for life. If the only authority they see in your school is white teachers, they're screwed for life. And I don't mean the black teacher teaching an African language. I mean the black teacher teaching physics. <coughs> because you see, they then begin to associate being smart with a particular kind of color. If the only people teaching them Mathematics are men, they begin to think that math belongs to men. 
And so it is your duty as a parent, not to say to the school, sort them out, but to make sure that the way you live your life, the people you call your friends, the people who come in and out of your home, don't look like you, don't pray like you, don't make love like you, but reflect the broadest diversity of our society. Then your kids will be normal. And trust me, I was at the University of the Free State. I know what not being normal is. <laughs> it's hard, and I never blame the kids. And let me also tell you this about academics. You know, I teach once a year in the richest school in the world. It's also a girls' school. It's called Castilea High School for Girls in Palo Alto, California, in the heart of the Silicon Valley, where Steve Jobs sent his daughter one year when I was teaching there and so on and so forth. And I teach in the worst school in, in the world, Oscar Pet High School in Nyanga. And you know what? I can tell you this with 100% certainty. The kids at Casti and the kids at Oscar Pet are exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the structure of opportunity. In the one school, you get all the opportunities. In the other school, <laughs> you don't. And given our history of inequality, you can't treat them all the same. You have to make a plan. And that is why I spent so much of my time, not just at beautiful, wonderful schools like this, when I was here before, but at schools where nothing is going on. Because for 18 hours a day, I have one duty, to make sure all our children succeed. But that also means that they have to enjoy access. And it is scandalous that you own me, or majority of your children are privileged kids. Do you really think that makes them normal? That's why they struggle. That's why black kids, like the young woman over here, begin to get to UCT, and then they get angry. The kids who got angry, they weren't from Parkwood, trust me, or from Allenburg, or from Google Edit. The kids who got angry came from bishops and Rondebosch boys, and it's because now they begin to think, oh my God, What's going on here? And so you have to deal with the race question. You have to deal with the class question. You have to deal with the gender question because of where we come from. And my appeal to you is not to do that out of obligation to the Department of Labor, as far as your teachers are concerned, or out of some obligation begrudgingly to the subcommittee of council because <coughs> they want to change. Do it. Because you say you're a Christian, or because you say you're Muslim, or because you say you're Jewish. Because of that deeper commitment in all our faiths that my child is not safe until everybody's child is safe. Malia Jackson became famous for the song that if I can help somebody as I walk along, then and only then my living shall not be in vain. Thank you very much.